We're in a series called Dwell. If you're new to our church family, if this is your first time with us on a Sunday, so glad that you're here. And this whole series is really about God's desire. His heart is to be with you. He wants a relationship with you. If you've ever heard that before, it's not what you do for God. It's not what you get from God. His desire is to be with you. His desire is to dwell. We see that all throughout Scripture from Genesis all the way to the end of the book. And so we go, Eden is a great example where God creates everything. He sees it as really good, and he he spends time with his creation. He doesn't just set everything in motion and then just walk away from it. He's not watching from a distance. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3, 8, that he was walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the morning. He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day is what the text tells us. And so we talked about in Eden how God gives Adam and Eve, uh, first humans, a directive. Hey, you you can enjoy all of creation. I've created all of this for you. I want you to enjoy it. I want to be with you in this, but don't take of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you miss week one, you can go back and watch that. It was two approaches to God, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Tree of life is all about relationship all about my identity in, in, in him, being led by him, surrendering my life over to him, tree of knowledge of good and evil, I'm trying to control. I'm trying to be in charge. I'm making my own decisions. And, and I, I'm really aware of the rules, but I just can't keep them, and it leads us to a place of death. That's what happens in the very beginning. And then God, he reestablishes really this covenant with his people. And we see in Exodus, he says, hey, I want to dwell with you again. Would you build me a sanctuary? So he leads his people out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Egypt. And and he says, hey, I want you to build me a tent. I want to come and reside with you. Here's what it says in Exodus 25, 8 through 9. Then have them make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern. I will show you. And so God desires to dwell with his people, and he gives them the design for the tabernacle. Last week, if you missed last week, master class on tabernacle. Pastor Josh crushed that. If you were here, you know it was a powerful time. If you missed it, you can go online and check that out. But tabernacle leads way to temple. So the people of God are wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, and God is leading them by his presence, literally in the wilderness to the promised land. They get to the promised land. He continues to reside in this tent, this tabernacle set up. We get all the way to King David, and one day David has this brand new house built. Looks good. He's in the palace. Bible tells us it's made of cedars. I don't know why that's a big deal, but apparently it's a big deal in ancient Near East. Back in the day, if you had cedars, you were somebody. You know what I mean? Like kings exchanging cedars to one another, that kind of thing. Like the granite countertops, the marble countertops of today, if you had cedars, you were rocking. So he looks, he looks at his situation, David does, and then he looks at the tabernacle, the tent where God dwells, and he says, hey, something's off here. And, and he has an idea. So David has an idea about the house that God should, should live in, but God has a different idea about the house that he should live in. I'm going to read this text in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Long text. Bear with me. Okay? And then we'll, we'll break it down. We'll unpack it together verse by verse. So it says this. After the king, this is David, was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar. Ooh, I got cedar. While the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Hey, you've been racking up victory after victory, my man. We've consolidated the kingdom. Come on, now you've taken the city of Jerusalem, and you've brought the ark. The presence of God is now here in the holy city, the future capital of Israel, Uh, Saul was after David. So Saul had been after David trying to kill David and Jonathan, a good friend of David's, but the son of Saul, and and he could claim right to the throne. But both of them in chapter five, um, they end up, they, they die in battle. And so the nemesis of David, the one who's after David to kill him and the one who would also have any kind of right to the throne have been taken out. David is undisputed king. And so the passage tells us that's where we're at. Nathan says, hey, God's with you clearly. Everything you do is, is, is in the right direction. God's with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, say, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Such a great question. 
I have not dwelled in a house from the day that I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with the tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers who I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house out of cedar? Bro, I don't care about cedar. Like God's saying, hey, I designed the tabernacle. I gave instruction for it. This is a cute idea that you have, David. Now tell my servant David, he's talking to Nathan, the prophet. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone. I've cut off all of your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I'll provide a place for my people Israel, and I'm going to plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time that I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I'll also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you, David. Hey, David, you want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house. Let's do this. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I'm going to establish his kingdom. He's the one who will build a house by my name. And I will establish the throne of his king for, uh, kingdom forever. I will be his father. Get this. He will be my son. When he's done wrong, I'll punish him with the rod wielded by men, flogging inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house, David, your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And then Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. I love this passage of scripture. It is such a cool passage of scripture, and there's a lot to unpack. I'd say it's probably the biggest, if not one of the biggest passages in First and Second Samuel, because it has the gospel just rooted in Second Samuel seven. We're actually going to do a teaching series over this summer in First and Second Samuel, and so part of me didn't want to share this today. I wanted to wait. Even bigger part of me. Uh, the Holy Spirit was like, nope, this is what you're preaching. So, so I'm going to give a remix on it, I guess, over the summer or something. We'll come at it from a different angle. But the whole idea, context, if you're new to the Bible, David is um, this walking contradiction. Uh, he, we, we love him. You know what I mean? David and Goliath, so great. We got him, you know, if, if you're in a Sunday school back in the day, you had the felt boards and, you know, you had the, had the slingshot and come on, give me the five stones. And we, we love David. David, he was ruddy and handsome, but he was born the youngest in the family. Uh, and he's a shepherd at an early age, but he ends up being king of all Israel. And, and he's a man after God's own heart is what scripture tells us. So he has this singular affection, many of the Psalms written by him, and yet he's an adulterer and a murderer. And so he, he's, he's unwavering in his support of King Saul. He refuses to kill King Saul, and yet really quickly he'll kill Uriah. You know what I'm saying? So he's just this walking contradiction. He's a hero and a shadow uh, of what should be. He, so he's this broken substitute for King Jesus. That's the whole idea of David. And we see it again here in 2 Samuel 7. David has an idea for the house that he's going to build God. But God's like, I've got a better idea. i got a better house. This is, this is my idea. And so Temple comes along. Uh, temple's a bit hard in that it's this imperfect thing uh, where God desires to dwell with his people. And all of a sudden, they're, they're like, hey, let's build a palace for God. Let's build a big old house for God. Let's set this thing apart. Let's make a big deal out of it. And God says, you don't understand quite what I'm doing when it comes to dwelling with my people. Look at, look at verse 1. It says this. We'll, pet, we'll, unbreak, we'll break it down. It says, after the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. And so centuries of struggle and political unrest, God has brought his people to the promised land. So they've worked their way through the wilderness, through the desert. Now they're in the promised land. How about when you get to the promised land, guess what happens? Now you got to fight for it. Isn't it funny? God will give you a promise. He'll give you a vision and a direction for your life, even bring you to the doorsteps of it. And he's like, all right, go get it. Right? And so that's the people of God. But he's fighting for them. And now all of a sudden there's a consolidation of the kingdom. Again, Saul's out of the picture. Jonathan's out of the picture. David is undisputed king. Everybody's in agreement. That's the guy in charge. He takes the city of Jerusalem. It's a big deal. Ark of the covenant, the presence of God is now here in the capital. 
And so chapter five, David settles in, builds in this big old house, and then looks over and sees God dwelling in a tent. Look at verse two. He said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. And David's comparison is not wrong. He is living in a house of cedar. God's presence, at least the, the, uh, the thing that's exemplifying of his presence, is in a tent. And so he thinks about it, and he thinks, man, look at where I'm at. Look at where I reside, and look where God dwells. Let me do God a favor. I'm about to upgrade. I'm about to upgrade God. And so it's implicit in the comparison is the idea that David is housed better than God somehow, a better standard of living than the one who created everything. And so from his position of strength, the idea is that he can do something significant for God, except we know that's not true. And so uh, the gesture seems well-meaning and generous and even sincere, but it's self-affirming and it's very unaware. Look at verse 3. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Now, Nathan hasn't even talked to the Lord about this yet. So, again, prophet, man of God, missed it. Why? Nobody prayed first. Nobody asked God anything about it. He was like, you know what? You seem to, be, you seem to know what you're doing. Like, you just keep racking up victory after victory. You just keep doing the right thing. Go for it. Clearly, God's with you. And then, uh, but God stiff arms Nathan, stiff arms David right here. Look at this next verse in four and five. It says, that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Hold up. What are we talking about, Nate? Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? David, you're going to build me a house? Look at verse six. I have, I'm not dealt, I have not dwelt in a house from the day that I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent, tabernacle as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to, the shepherd, to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house out of cedar? Come on, what's going on? And so what God is saying is that his dwelling place is not a king's palace. It's not a high mountain. It's not subject to architecture or design, or position, geography. He's saying, my dwelling place is with my people. That's where I dwell, David. It's not, about, it's not about a space. It's about my people. And by this time, the tabernacle, I want you to think about this. The tabernacle has been in use for hundreds of years, 40 years in the desert. And then post, once they step into the promised land, they've still housed the Ark of the Covenant. They still house the presence of God in this tent Think, I don't know about your tent game, but like my tents after a while wear out. You know what I'm saying? Like just break down, there's holes in them. It's just like, I'm going to imagine the tabernacle, gold flakes peeling off, poles all bent. You know, what, what used to fabric looking all good back in the day, not looking that great. And so David's looking at it, he's like, I got cedar. Oh, I got some cedar. You know, and, and look at this, this tabernacle is rough. But God says, I'm with my people. If they suffer, I'm with them. If they thirst, I give them something to drink. If they wander, I lead them in their wandering. If their clothing and their homes are threadbare, then mine is too. Sounds a lot like the son of man. And so David says, man, now that I'm settled, God, you need a house to live in to commemorate the victories. This is something that you see in the ancient Near East. Back in the day, big military victory and the king, whoever's in charge, would, would, would raise up a temple. And so that's how others thought. But God goes, that's not who I am. My desire is to dwell with my people. Some people view God as remote, aloof, like he is unaware of your situation, like he doesn't care about your situation, like he's not with you. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the Christian bend on our God is that he comes to dwell with us. This is, Jesus makes this most obvious. He is literally God made manifest in human form, and, and the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in Jesus. And so God's desire is to be with his people. We see it all the way back in this text. And so um, God wants a relationship, and he desires to be involved in his creation. It's central to the message of who Jesus is and who we are in him. I want you to think about, think about this. If you're an artist, uh, we got any artists? We got any people who are good at art? Okay. 
Some of you are real shy, real humble, or we're not very talented. Okay, one of the two. So I don't know what it's like at Moretz. Maybe you got all the people, all, all the artists over there. So if you're an artist and you just like your magnum opus, just like the best thing that you've ever made in your life, you're like, that's it. That's, that's the top. That's the peak. That's the pinnacle. That's my Sistine Chapel. And, and then someone hits you up and they're like, hey, can we put it on display? We got an art gallery. We got a museum. We got this exhibit. Come on, can you put your work on display? But you hear word, they lose a lot of art or ruin a lot of art, jack stuff up, right? And so as the, art, as the one who created it, when it comes time for that installation, you're going to show up for the installation. You're going to bring your art. Like, here's my art. Who's, who's hanging this on the wall? Right? You're going to make sure that everything is as it should be. You're invested as the one who created it. You show up. And so this is the God that we serve, who creates everything that we see, isn't remote, isn't aloof, is invested and shows up on the scene, desires to be with his creation. What it means is God dwells and enters in the things that matter to God. You know what matters to God? You. People matter to God. And we see this over and over again. This is where he dwells. And so David takes the wrong approach with God on his idea for a dwelling place. David thinks that God wants to be separate from the masses. God needs his own palace. David forgot what it's like to be a shepherd. He forgot what it's like to be just a kid running around or a guy who's with his army or just rolling with his people. And now we've got some successes, some victories. Now I need cedar paneling. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and it's like, man, my God needs to be set apart in a way that we got to build this crazy thing that just tells everybody how amazing my God is. Except no amount of architecture, no amount of building, no amount of marble is going to ever exemplify the God that David serves And so in the ancient Near East, whenever there was a major victory for a king over another enemy or territory, the king would always build this temple, right? And so this is exactly what David does. The Assyrians did it. The Persians did it. The Egyptians did it. I'm going to give you one example. Um, Tutmos, Pharaoh of Egypt, builds a temple for the god Amun-Re, and we get this in Scripture. It says this, Tutmos III, since you have built my dwelling place... And you have outstripped all other kings in building my monuments. Now I will establish your throne unto distant days. Does that sound familiar? But it's this quid pro quo. It's this, hey, if you, if you rack up enough victories, if you allow me to rack up enough victories, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build you a temple. Right? If you'll build me a house, I, I, I'll establish your reign. And so David says to God, because of what you've done, I'll build you a house. It's, it's in response to the victories that he's experienced. And God is like, what are we talking about? David, everything that you see, I made it. <laughs> like I spoke and all creation happened. Like all the stars you see in the sky, I put them there. You, th- you want to put cedar paneling up in my house? I don't care. I made the cedars, brother. Like the cedar forest, like that was my idea. Photosynthesis. David, you don't even know what that is yet. Like I did that, right? So it's like all of creation, every flora, every fauna, every. David, I made you. Little, little, little dude with some red hair running around in the field, keeping sheep. Like I, like I made you who you are, everything that you see. And so this is the God that we serve. And David forgets. He forgets. He, he's made it about uh, architecture, and he's made it about design, and he's made it about these things that God doesn't really care about. Here's my point. God doesn't need your cedar paneling. He does not need your cedar paneling. It, it's like the God who has everything at his disposal does not need you to build him something. You know people who are the richest people in the world, like super rich. I love it when the super rich just drive beaters. You know what I'm talking about? Because they, they drive that old truck. Or like Warren Buffett, he'll drive like cars that are like 15 years old. You know what I mean? He'll buy a car, intentionally, buy stuff that's 15 years. Because what kind of car are you going to drive the less people know you're worth $60 billion? You know what I'm saying? And God's like, are you kidding me? What kind of house? You can't box me in. Like, this is, this is symbolism as well. Like, I, my presence is everywhere. And specifically, my presence is with my people. It doesn't matter if it's a tent or, or, or a building or whatever. None of that really boxes me in. God's desire is to dwell, and he doesn't do so because of ceiling height or finishings or fixtures. Like, we walk into a certain space. Man, they got a fountain. God must be here. You know what I mean? Like, no one does that. Like, and so God, God dwells with his people. His presence isn't at Holler Mill. 
His presence isn't at Moretz. His presence isn't, it's not at the new building at 1100. Whenever we get it, his presence is with his people. And we forget so quick. Man, it makes me so sad. There's churches that uh, they have these amazing buildings. Amazing, massive buildings worth tons of money. All the assets in the world. 20 people. Why? The presence of God is what builds it. It's only always the presence of God. Entire denominations, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of assets. No one cares. Why? Because the presence of God is what builds it. It's the presence of God. Which means you can go in a field, meet in a tent, if the presence of God is there. That is great decorum. I would rather, I would rather have the decorum of the presence of God than any kind of finishing. Cool. Wood floors. Who cares? Like, I would rather God show up and meet with people. And, and what would it, how cool would it be as Soma if we could decorate our church uh, not with brick and mortar, not with, I mean, drywall, whatever, like, but with the testimonies of God's faithfulness in your life. How amazing would it be if as a church we could decorate and be marked by a people, be marked by a place. When people come in, they're just weirded out by the presence of God. Brooke and I, we went to a church not that long ago. We went to uh, some friends, went to go visit them that are leading a church in Dallas area last year. They, brought the, they bought this old church building that they were meeting in. Church building was ugly. It was terrible. And uh, it was paint on a pig. I mean, literally just bought this old ugly church building, just painted everything white. And, and, and I was like, I was underwhelmed because these are mentors. These are people that we follow. We're like, wow, these people are killing it, but their church building is terrible. You know, like, and it was that kind of thing. We walked in and then not the whole time. I didn't even see it. I didn't even look up. Their house is so marked by the presence of God. The joy of the Lord so marked the people in that space. I didn't even think to look at the ceiling. And I was overwhelmed, and I was like, y'all decorate so good. You know, because, like, the people, the people make the place. And so it just it blew me away that the presence of God was so tangible. And, and I think this is what God's trying to get to David. Hey, David, oh, man, are you kidding me? Like, that's cute, but that's not, that's not how this works. Uh, look at verse 8 and 9. He says, I took you, David, from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. He's just letting them know who's in charge. By the way, I chose you, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies. Dave, that, you're not that great. I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. And so what you see here is something that's totally unlike any other kind of worldview, any other kind of approach to God. Again, every other major world religion is, is that quid pro quo. Man, if I do enough, maybe God will favor me. And sometimes we do this in church space, even as Christians, where the thought is, man, if I show up enough, if I read my Bible enough, if I do enough religious activity, if I serve enough, if I, and then we try and box God into this corner where, God, you didn't, you didn't do for me because I've been doing for you, and this is this mindset. And Dave, David's being reminded right now, hey, it's only always grace, Dave. It's only always grace. I made you who you are. Guess what? I'm going to keep blessing you, not because of what you've done for me, but because of who I am. And so... David has this posture, this idea that the way to God was to do something for God. And God says, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with my people. I just want to dwell. And so David says, he says to David, hey, everything you've ever done, I've done it through you. And instead of building me a house, David, because you can't box me in, how about I build yours? That's what he says in this passage. And this is, this is the opposite of the way that we think. Our God doesn't work the way that everybody else works, the way that broader culture works. And, and so, man, I'm just so, I'm so grateful that I serve a God who is not a conditional God. Is anybody else grateful for grace that we serve a God who's not conditional? It's based on my works, based on my merit, based on my behavior, ooh, based on my pedigree. Thank God. Y'all ever done Ancestry.com and you, you learn about how jacked up your family is? You're like, wow. Like, it, and so thank God it's not based on any of that. It's only based on his grace. And so it's not a condition. God says, I don't want that. How about I build your house and then you are very aware that every good and perfect gift comes from above, Dave. How about that? And so when you begin to believe and I begin to believe that it's our good behavior or our works that earn our way to God then we begin to try and get a certain response. We begin to try and control God. 
You're frustrated and you're upset because you're doing all the religious things and you're not getting the response that you want. Meantime, he's going, would you just meet with me? Would you just be with me? And as you're with him and as you spend time in his presence, you gain a perspective and you gain a love and you gain a presence that you wouldn't have outside of that. Just some, some kind of religious approach. It just is a, a desire to control. Brooke and I, we're in this small group. We're in a, we're in a married small group. And, uh, and we love it because our whole bin, the whole thing is talking about date night. What, like, and we're, we're, we're having ideas for date night. The whole idea is we group together and then we go on a date. That's literally it because, like, we, wanna, we all kind of want to go on a date. And so, like, we meet for a little bit. But it's always stories and small talk around how'd you meet? What's the story of, like, your first date? What was, you know, oh, man, we on the phone till 3 a.m. No, 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 nobody likes talking on the phone. Or, like, when you first went, you know, we went to dinner that one time or funny stories about, you know, that season of life. But no one ever says, hey, you know why I married her? Because I can control her. You know why I married him? Because I can domesticate him. I just knew I was like, that guy, that brother right there, I can train him. Like, no one ever says that. People might be thinking that, but no, no one ever says that. The desire is, the desire is, I want to be with this person. I want to be in a relationship with this person. And God says, I'm going to build a house for you. You don't build a house for me. And when you begin to think that our relationship is based on you earning something and not grace, then you missed it. And here's the sad news. They go on and they build the temple. And God says, hey, if you make it about a structure, this isn't going to work. If you forget to be in relationship with me, if you forget to depend on me, if you forget to, if you forget to, to worship me, honor me with your lives, I'm going to ruin this thing. I'm going to run it in the ground. And he does. He sends them into exile for 70 years. They come back, Ezra, the, Ezra 3, they re, rebuild the temple. But the temple's always, it's never enough. It's always like a shadow of what could be. And it's always mildly frustrating, man. We just can't get the presence of God the way that we want the presence of God. Why? Because it's all pointing to something greater, a greater temple. God is building his house. He says, David, instead of you building it, let me build it. Look at verse 10. He says, I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. God doesn't want you to build him a house. He wants to build you a home. He goes on, he says, I will also give you rest from all your enemies. And the reason why God didn't give David, didn't want David to build a house is because David was trying to build the wrong kind of house. Also, David was the one that wasn't supposed to build the house. And the time to build the house, it wasn't time yet to build the house, which is why God never said, hey, it's time to build me a house. It's time to build me a temple. He had something better in mind. Look at verse 12. He says, when your days are over, David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. This is 2 Samuel 7. It is a long time before we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's a long time before we get to the person of Jesus, and yet God's calling his shot. God's saying to David, I'll build your house, and I promise to make you a dynasty. I will generously and unconditionally, because of my faithfulness, because of my own covenant, because of my commitment, I, I commit myself to these people regardless of merit, regardless of their pedigree or what they did. I will commit myself to them to the degree that death nor sin will break my commitment. I'm going to build my house. There's three important points that God makes to David right here. I think they're really important. I speak to Jesus. He says it's going to be the son of David. He says he's going to conquer death. He said he's going to be my son, the son of God. And Paul understood this and gave commentary to it in Romans 1. Here's what the apostle Paul says about this passage. Romans 1, 1 through 4. says that Jesus was the descendant of David. And who, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And then he names him Jesus Christ our Lord. You and I can try and, and, and do things for God. You and I can try and build a temple. You and I can try and focus on exterior. You and I can put the cedar paneling up. And the whole time he's like, that is a waste of your, that's an epic waste of your time. Like my desire is to be with you. My desire is to have a real relationship with you by way of Christ. And so what David wanted in the temple was a house for God. But God says, I'll build the house 
And here's how I'm going to do it. Jesus will be crucified. He'll be stripped. He'll be exposed. He'll wander. He'll be homeless. The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Jesus will experience the punishment of sin, and he'll overcome death and sin, and he'll make a way for us to have a home and true rest from our enemies, not because of your strength or my strength, but because there is a greater builder, because there is a greater temple. In Jesus, we have hope. And Jesus comes and makes this bold claim. I love it. In John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, destroy this temple. I'll raise it again in three days. I mentioned before that every time a king wins a victory in the ancient Near East, historically, every time a king would win a victory, they'd put a temple up in honor of the God. Hey, you allowed us to win this victory. So we're going we're gonna to build this temple. And you know what's amazing? You know when Jesus has ultimate victory over death, hell, and the grave? You know the temple that God erects in Christ? You. How crazy is that? He decides, he says, hey, Jesus, when, when he leaves and he goes to the Father, my spirit's going to come. I'm going to dwell among you. You're going to be an extension of me to the ends of the earth. Because it's not about brick and mortar, and it's not about geography. And it's not, listen, you know where God shows up? You know where God moves? You know where God comes? Where he's wanted. So thinking in the theme of revival, just this idea of where does God move? It does, it's not subject to a, a specific city. It's not subject to geography. It's not subject to a certain population. Where it's subject is, are the people of God hungry for God's presence? And then he comes and he dwells. And his desire is to be with us, but he's like, hey, you just got to receive what I'm offering, what I'm giving. I would love to come and reside. And so what if instead of us trying so hard to prove ourselves and to put up cedar paneling and can I be honest with you, man? I'm like, I literally, I'm writing this message. I'm sitting in this ridiculous building that we bought and all this is at God's direction. I feel really confident that God led us to where he led us, but I'm literally, I'm sitting in this building uh, at 1100, the new space that we're working on. And I'm like looking around, it's the most ridiculous property in the region. So I'm just standing there. I'm like, this is crazy. And so, and I'm feeling a little bit, I'm like, am I supposed to be convicted right now? Like where I'm standing. And so I'm wrestling in my spirit and God's like, Hey, Michael, it, none of this matters. Like, I, I mean, I led you here. I opened up doors. I created opportunity. All oh, that's me. Stop stressing about the finishing, stop stressing about the particulars, stop stressing about what it's going to look like, where it's going to go. Stop stressing about any of that stuff. S care more about my presence and more about what I desire to do in and through a people than any specific place, any specific geography, any specific building. You're here right now, not because of a building. You're here right now because of people and the spirit presence himself among you and it might have been a mom might have been a dad might have been a cousin might have been a co-worker might have been somebody in the locker room but the presence of God that temple made its way into your life and then displayed the person of Jesus and so what if we as Soma what if we ask God to de decorate our house with the testimonies of changed lives what if people walked in and they did not even notice the floor what if people walked in and they were so overwhelmed by the joy of the Lord and the presence of God, they were like, what is that? And it wouldn't matter where we went. It wouldn't matter where we were because God would be with us. What if our decor was simply the presence of God? You know where God dwells? He dwells with his people. So let's make sure that we stay a people of grace, a people dependent on the spirit of God who keeps Jesus at the center of all that we do. Listen, we're headed in. This is Holy Week. You have friends and family, I do too, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who are far from God, who desperately need the presence of God in their lives. Not a program, not a service, not a building, not an organization. They need Jesus. And going into next week, I'm begging you, take inventory. Who are the people who are closest to me? If you can share your salvation and be Jesus and lead them to Christ right where you're at, you don't have to bring them. But just if, if there's people in your life that you can bring, people are more receptive to come and lean into Easter than any other service. Like people who are just in that religious rhythms, just, you know, whatever, they'll just show up. But man, they need an encounter with the living God. That's what they need an encounter with. 
They need to know that God loves them. God is for them. His desire is to reside. His desire is to be with them. And he does that by way of Jesus and his finished work. Okay, so as a church family, can we pray headed into next week? Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see opportunities to invite people into this space. Can we pray that prayer as a church family? Can we believe for that? And can we stop being the people who try and build our own thing instead of just being led by God to build the things that he's asking us to build? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for today. God, we're so grateful for the way that you're working, so grateful that you build your house, Jesus. Oh, that you build the church. And nothing, hell, death, sin, brokenness, disease, like nothing comes in the way of you building what you promised to build. And so we're so grateful. We honor you. We worship you. It's all about you. Oh, that you are the true temple. You are the better temple. The presence of God comes and the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in you. And then you offer us this incredible grace on our lives that you would give us your very spirit, that we are walking around temples of you. Help us to be mindful of the fact that we're an extension of you. Help us to be mindful of the fact that we are your dwelling place every single day. When we come into contact with people, God, when we wake up, our feet hit the floor where your dwelling place. Would you help us to be mindful of that? For those of us who are in Christ, and for those of us who just feel far from God today, maybe you're here today and you have just felt far from God in this season. You don't have a real relationship with Jesus. You don't have a real relationship with God. You can do all kinds of religious things. Again, you can focus on the external. That's not the house he's building. The one he's building is he wants to be with you. He's building a people. And if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you're ready to go all in, make it the leader of your life, experience salvation. The Bible tells us it's by grace that God saves us. But the vehicle by which he does this is our faith. It's through faith. Your faith right now, believing that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came, lived a perfect life, died in your place, and rose again three days later so that you and I could experience eternity with him, so that you and I could experience his presence. If that's you today, with all of our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus and come home, go all in. Put your faith in him. Would you just raise your hand in the room, either at this location or at Moretz? You just lift your hand in the room and say, that's me. I desperately need Jesus. Amen. Is there anybody else? If that's you, just lift your hand and say, I need that. Hand doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. But a moment of confession is really important. Amen. Right where you're at, if that's you, you raised a hand, you didn't raise a hand, but you just feel the Holy Spirit prompting you, hey, I need you to go all in. I need you to surrender. I need you to come into right relationship. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, thank you. I love you. I see you. God, I'm so grateful for this moment that you led me here, that you've used family and friends and all kinds of people in my life to lead me to this place of real surrender where I realize who I am in relationship to who you are. And I'm so grateful for the way that you love me, for the way that you're for me, that you're with me right now in this moment. And God, that you desire to take all of my pain, all of my indecision, all of my brokenness and sin, God, past, present, and future, all of my shame, you take that on. You've paid for it already. I'm tired of paying for it as well. God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And God, would you help your presence to dwell moving forward? My desire is that I would be led by you. My desire is that I would have an awareness that you are with me at all times. Holy Spirit, would you lead me moving forward? Give me eyes to see people the way that you see people. Give me a heart that loves God. God, draw me near to you. Help me to love you with everything that I am. And out of the overflow of that, love people the way that you've called me to. I desire that you dwell, Lord. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said... Amen and amen. Church family, can we just celebrate anybody who's made a decision to surrender their life to Christ? Can we stand to our feet? Let's stand to our feet. Let's worship together as we close. Let's sing to Jesus.